It's my great pleasure today to introduce Joe Halpern as our plenary keynote speaker. Joe has been a professor at Cornell for the past 20 years and is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and a fellow of AAAI, ACM, and IEEE, among other organizations. He's received numerous awards for his research contributions, including the ACM SIGART Autonomous Agents Research Award, the Dijkster Prize, the ACM AAAI Newell Award, and the Gödel Prize. He also started and runs the computer science part of Archive, where he tells me all of you should be posting your papers. So please join me in welcoming Joe Halpert. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks to Sheila and Killian for inviting me. So this is actually going to be the, the one-hour version of a book that, that was published last year. So if you like this stuff, go buy the book, MIT Press. Uh, so this is joint work with lots of people. I, I got introduced to the area by Uta Pearl. Um, later work that I'll talk about with Hannah Chocklau and Chris Hitchcock, who's a philosopher at Caltech. Um, so the big picture. Defining causality is hard. People have been trying literally for millennia. Uh, the literature distinguishes two types of causality. One that statisticians, by and large, have focused on that philosophers have called type causality. Smoking causes cancer. And what I'm going to be focusing on in this talk is what philosophers call token or actual causality. So if you think of type causality as talking about groups, token causality talks about individuals. The fact that Willard smoked for 30 years is what caused him to get cancer. So the law, for example, is really concerned with token causality. So here's the canonical example. So it's true that it was pouring rain last night, and I was drunk. But the cause of the accident was the faulty brakes. And that's why I'm suing GM, since I'm living in the States and we're a very litigious society. So what am I saying here? So as far as token causality goes, um, sorry, as far as type causality goes, in general, pouring rain is a cause of accidents. In general, drunk driving is a cause of accidents. But I'm saying in this case, it wasn't the fact that I was drunk. I drive great when I'm drunk. It wasn't the fact that it was pouring rain. I'm also really great at driving and pouring rain. It was those faulty brakes. Right? So it's that that I want to make sense out of. What should that mean? And the traditional story, for some reason, something doesn't work out right. Um, so you know, why do we care? Well, uh, issues of actual causality come up all the time in the law. That's what law really does care about a lot. Historians, scientists are interested in causality. Uh, statisticians tend to be mainly concerned with token uh, uh, type causality, but they also care about token causality. And, Recently, if I have time at the end, I'll, I'll say why it's relevant to CS. But So attempts to define causality go back to Aristotle. That's why I say it's millennia. Uh, the modern view arguably dates back to Hume. That's 1748. In the philosophy world, that's modern. Uh, and a relatively recent trend, which goes back to David Lewis, is, is to use counterfactuals. And that's what I'll be focusing on. So the idea is that, roughly speaking, A is a cause of B. If A hadn't happened, then B wouldn't have happened. That's what the law calls but-for causality. But-for A, B wouldn't have happened. And when I say that it was the brakes that caused the accident, what I mean is, had the brakes not been faulty, I wouldn't have had the accident. It was the brakes. Even if it hadn't been raining, I still would have had the accident. Even if I hadn't been drunk, I still would have had the accident. But if the brakes had been OK, I would not have had the accident. So I'm using. In this case, the legal notion of but-for causality. But for the brakes, I wouldn't have had the accident. Now, the trouble is that but-for causality doesn't always work, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a second. Um, but what's really hard about this area, I'm, I'm going to give you a definition, and I would love to be able to prove a theorem that says this is the right definition. I'm a theoretician. That's what I do. I prove theorems. If I only knew the statement of the theorem, I might have a shot at proving it. But I don't know what it means to have the right definition of causality. I don't, I don't know what the theorem should say. And so what's traditional in the literature, and, and frankly what I'll be doing as well, is uh, the philosophers and the lawyers have come up with hundreds of examples. And the way you show your definition is good is to show that, gee, look at how well it does it all in all the examples. And that works fine until somebody comes along and constructs an example to show your definition maybe wasn't as good as you thought it was. And that actually happened. So Uta Pearl and I gave a definition that appeared in the UAR conference in 2001. Uh, you had a student, Mark Hopkins, who came up with a counterexample to that definition, or an example that showed it just didn't do what we thought was the right thing. 
uh, we gave a, an improved, i.e. corrected definition that appeared in the journal version of the paper, which was in the British Journal of Philosophy of Science in 2005. Uh, and then I came up with yet another definition a couple of years ago that appeared in Ichikai. How do I know this is the right definition? Well, again, I don't. Um, I think it's pretty good. It works pretty well in all the examples. The philosophers keep trying to come up with examples to show that it doesn't work well. I tell them they've got the wrong model, but it could very well be the case. Somebody will come up with another example that shows it's not quite right. If I have time at the end, I'm going to argue maybe for computer science, we should worry a little bit less about the examples uh, for, for pragmatic reasons, but let me get to that. But let me at least show you the problem, why the but for definition doesn't always work. So this is an example due to David Lewis but there are all sorts of examples like this in the legal literature. I'll briefly mention one. So imagine Susie and Billy both pick up rocks and throw them at a bottle. Susie maybe threw a millisecond earlier or throws a bit harder. Her rock gets there first, shattering the bottle. But both throws are perfectly accurate. You can see Billy's rock going over where the bottle would have been had Susie not thrown. So Billy's rock would have shattered the bottle if Susie hadn't thrown. So Susie is not a but-for cause of the bottle shattering. Had Susie not thrown, the bottle would have shattered anyway. Nevertheless, we want to say that Susie's the cause of the bottle shattering and Billy isn't. Now, if you think this is just an example the philosophers came up with, which it is, uh, let me tell you I was on a, there was a workshop that brought together philosophers and lawyers, and I was the token computer scientist, and they were playing a tape of a Supreme Court case. And it went more or less like this that um, the, the, the accused was a drug dealer who had sold heroin. Uh, to somebody who died. And there was no dispute at the, at the fact he had sold him heroin. Um, but the guy who died had a serious heart condition and all the doctors agreed he would have died within a day or two anyway. Think Susie and Billy, right? So is the drug dealer the cause, is the fact that he sold him the drugs the cause of the patient's death? And, and the drug dealer's defendant was saying he would have died anyway. It's not a but-for cause. And you can hear Justice Kagan in the background going, no, it's not a but-for cause. And so the law understands that but-for causality can't be the whole story. And there are lots of cases like this in the law. And they don't have a good definition to deal with this. So roughly speaking, we'd like to say, well, if Susie hadn't thrown under the contingency that Billy didn't hit the bottle, then the bottle wouldn't have shattered. So we sort of want to say, but for the fact that Susie threw, keeping fixed the fact that Billy didn't hit the bottle. And we sort of want to argue that works for saying that Susie's a cause, but not Billy. And you know, why is Susie the cause and not Billy? Well, roughly speaking, we'd like to say, well, duh, it's because Susie's rock hit the bottle and Billy's didn't. So can we make that precise? So let me talk about the formal model, because. There's going to be a bunch of definitions based on this formal model. Uh, an hour ago, I briefly talked about notions of moral responsibility and intention also based in this model. So the model is really due to Perl, and it uses what are called structural equations. The idea is the world is modeled by a bunch of structural equations. So we decide there's going to be a bunch of variables. Some of the variables we're going to call exogenous. Exogenous variables are, we think of them as being outside of the control of the modeler. That's just the way the world is. Why did Susie and Billy throw rocks? I don't know. That's just the way the world is. They like throwing rocks. Um, so the exogenous variables are the ones that we don't really think about when we talk about causality because they're outside of our control. They're sort of given. That's the way the world is. The endogenous variables are the rest. And then for each endogenous variable, we have an equation that relates that endogenous variable to other variables. So the way to think about this I suspect most of you have seen Bayesian networks, so think of a Bayesian network, a cyclic directed graph. At the top of the graph, we have the exogenous variables. Their values are sort of given outside the model. And then each of the variables not at the very top, those are the endogenous variables. And now we're not talking about probability. Each one of them has an equation that tells you its value as a function of the value of its parents. So once you know the values of the exogenous variables, the ones at the top of the DAG, you can work your way down and figure out the values of all the other variables. Now, the one big advantage of these structural equations is they define the effects of interventions. So if I go in and say, so imagine we had some kind of model. We believe we have a model of how the world works in terms of what causes people to default on loans, right? So we think there are various factors that cause people to default on loans. 
not having a steady source of income, um, bad work habits, I don't know, take your model, people presumably have some kind of a model, and again, the way I'm thinking about it, there's no probability at this point, I'll talk about probability later, but each variable, its value is given by the values of its parents. The parents are the ones that affect this, and this affects this, this affects this, and in the end, that's what affects you not getting a loan. Now we can see what happens. Suppose I was to change something in the world. Suppose I were to intervene and somehow give you a lot of money. If we're saying that the reason that you didn't pay back the loan is that you don't have enough money, if I were to give you $10,000, would you then pay back the loan? What's the effect of that intervention? So the equations tell us that. The equations tell us the value of this variable if you change the values of other variables. So that's the point of this model. It tells you the effect of interventions. So this is the one slide we're going to get with a bit of a logic. Don't take it too seriously. That's not the heart of the talk. Um, but let me tell you what these symbols mean. So we want to reason about causality. We want to make statements about causality. The primitive events are x is 3. This variable has value 3. The interesting statement I want to make is the second line here where I say after intervening and setting capital X to little x, if I set x to 1, then fee holds. If I gave you a lot of money, you would pay back the loan. If the brakes had been OK, I wouldn't have had the accident, as opposed to if it hadn't been raining, I still would have had the accident. So imagine intervening and somehow magically setting the brakes to be OK. We can ask the question, would I have had the accident? And the answer will depend on the causal model. And the language lets us close off under causality. So a causal model is a tuple. Technically, it has exogenous variables. The modeler has to decide which variables are outside of the control of the model. That's just the way they are. The rest of the variables are endogenous. And then we have a set of equations, one for each endogenous variable. And then we can say, and here's the interesting part, once we're given a model and the context, the context is a setting of the exogenous variables. Once I tell you the values of the variables at the top, well, I can tell you if y is 3. Because once I know the values of the variables at the top, that determines everything going down. I hope that makes some sense. And here's the interesting. I can answer the question, if I were to set x to 1, would phi be true? That's what this formula is saying. Come on. That's what this formula is saying. If I were to set x to 1, would phi be true? How do I figure that out? Well, I look at a new model, which is just like the old model, except that whatever equation I used to have for x, throw it out and replace it by the equation that says x is now 1. Whatever you thought, you know, you used to think that x was y plus z, forget that, x is now 1. And so that, now we have a new model where in that model, x has been clamped to 1. And we can ask in that new model, if magically I made the brakes OK in that new model, where everything else is the same except now the brakes are OK, would I have the accident? Right? And I can determine that just using the, the rules I've given before. Right, so that's it. Let me give you some examples now. Um, I still haven't defined causality. But let me stop and say what's important here is that causality is going to be relative to a model. A can be a cause of B in one model. It might not be the cause of B in a different model. And a lot of the confusion in the literature, I claim, is people are just using different models. And we can debate which is a better model or a worse model. I'll say a bit more about that in a second. What that means is even if lawyers accept this definition, you can still imagine lawyers arguing about which is the better model. As you'll see, there's even more for them to argue about, right? So right now, I have nothing to say about what makes a model good or bad. I'm just going to give you a definition, or at least in a few slides, a definition of causality relative to a model, right? So let's start with a simple example. Imagine you have two arsonists that drop lit matches in different parts of a dry forest, and then the forest burns down. So we can imagine two scenarios, one I'll call the disjunctive scenario, where just one match is enough to get the forest to burn. And the conjunctive scenario, you need both matches for the forest to burn down. The way we capture the difference is by equations. So in both cases, we have the same network. We have an exogenous variable at the top that's whatever it is that makes these arsonists want to drop matches. Who knows? That's determined outside the scope of the model. I'm not going to try to figure out and play psychologist to figure out why uh, the arsonists want to drop matches. Then we have two variables, arsonist 1, arsonist 2. that are binary variables. They take value either 0 or 1, where the value is 1 if the guy drops a match, and the value is 0 if he doesn't drop a match. And finally, I have a variable here for the forest burns down. What's the equation for the forest burns down? Well, that depends. 
in the disjunctive scenario where it only takes one guy, it's a disjunction. If either one drops the match, then the forest burns. In the conjunctive scenario, it's a conjunction. If both drop the match, then the forest burns. So the difference between the two scenarios is captured by differences in the equations. I hope that makes some sense. So now defining causality. Um, so we want, to, we want to define what it means for A to be a cause of B, given a model and a context. So I stress the definition is relative to a model and a context. And again, for now, there's no probability. I will be introducing probability. But these models and contexts, everything is completely deterministic. So I'm assuming I understand exactly how the world works, and the world works deterministically. No quantum mechanics here. Um, so I'm going to restrict causes to conjunctions of primitive events. So I, I can say the fact that x is 1 and y is 2, that's a cause. So it's the fact that it could be the case that it's the fact that both the rain and the fact that I was drunk, they were the cause. If I was just drunk, I'd be okay. If it was just raining, I'd be okay. But driving drunk in the rain, that's not so good. Um, so that can happen. So let me not worry about the technical details, but, but let me give you the formal definition. So I, again, I repeat that I have now three papers that attempt to give formal definitions of causality. Um, and all three have the same format. They have three clauses, AC1, AC2, and AC3. Um, they all agree on AC1 and AC3, which I'll tell you in a second, and they differ on AC2, and that's the heart of the definition. So let me do the easy stuff first. What does it mean for that little vector at the top means I have a set of variables. So this could be x1 is 1 and x2 is 3, right? So th that's all the vector means, that there's a set of variables here. So what does it mean to say x equals 1 is a cause of phi? Well, I would never say that x equals 1 is a cause of phi in a particular situation if, it hadn't, if, if it's not the case that x is actually 1 and phi actually happened. So I wouldn't say the fact that brakes were faulty was the cause of the accident if I didn't have an accident or if the brakes weren't faulty. We just don't do that in natural language. Okay, so that's AC1. It just says that um, to call A a cause of B, A and B both have to have happened. And AC3 is a minimality condition. It says there's no irrelevant conjuncts in X. So I want to say that, that um, okay, it's, it's the faulty brakes that are the cause of the accident. Maybe I sneezed while I was driving. I want to say that's relevant. But if I just look at AC1 and AC2, it turns out that faulty brakes and sneezing is as much a cause of the accident as faulty brakes. So AC3 says, no, 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 get rid of any irrelevant stuff. So I want it to be a minimal set of things. OK, let me look at AC2. So uh, let me say that, that, that the nice thing about the third definition, the one I had in, in, in a couple of years ago, uh, it had, it's the simplest one. I also think it's the best one for other reasons. But uh, if you think this is bad, all I can tell you is the first definition was much worse. Uh, so here's the intuition. So if you ignore this clause, the W clause here, just ignore this for a second, and look at the rest. It's a straight counterfactual. Remember the counterfactual said x equals 1 is a cause of phi. If x hadn't been 1, if it had been something else, phi would not have happened. Well, that's what this says. Um, if you can find, you're going to say that x equals little x is a cause. If you can find an x prime, if you can find a different value for x, such that if you change x to, if you intervene and change x to x prime, then phi didn't happen, right? That's the straight but for, if w were the empty set, if this w just weren't there at all, this thing that I've got shaded, if that weren't there, that would literally be the standard but for definition of causality. If x hadn't been 1, then phi wouldn't have happened. If x had been something else, phi wouldn't have happened. What's the w doing? Well, w is just some other variables over at the side. And I'm allowed to clamp them at their actual values, the values they had in the real situation. So I get to say, well, suppose I change x from being 1 to 0. And in the meantime, keeping these other variables w fixed at their actual value, then phi doesn't happen. I suspect for almost all of you who haven't seen this before, like, what's he doing? This doesn't make sense. So all I ask is, wait for two slides, and I'll go back to Susie and Billy and show you where this comes up. Uh, don't try to understand it. I mean, try to understand what this is saying, but you won't understand the point of it until you see the examples. So, so bear with me. I understand that it's not obvious why this is saying anything useful. Um, but again, what it's saying is, if we were to keep some other variables fixed at their actual value, keep them clamped, then if you change x to a different value, phi doesn't happen. So 
then, then the counterfactual applies. So let's go back to the arsonist. There it's easy. Um, let's take the, the conjunctive scenario where it takes both matches to get the forest burning. Then I would say each of the arsonists is a cause. Each of the arsonists is a but-for cause. Had arsonist one not dropped a match, there wouldn't have been a fire. Had arsonist two not dropped a match, there wouldn't have been a fire. The only point of going through this is saying that an effect can have more than one cause. They're each separately causes. The conjunction is not a cause because it's not minimal. I don't need them both to drop matches. I just need one of them to drop a match to get the fire going in the conjunctive case. Again, I hope that makes some sense. All right, the disjunctive case, though, I need both of them. So in the disjunctive case, uh, according to my definition, both of them dropping a match is a cause. Uh, I need, and again, if you, if you think of the counterfactual, but for the fact that they both dropped a match, there wouldn't have been a fire. If I change both of them to not dropping a match, then there's no fire. Now, in English, I still think we say that, that, that each one of them is a cause. That's because I think in English, if we have a conjunction of things being a cause, we typically call every single one of them a cause. That's natural language, but, but the formal definition requires the conjunction. All right, let me do the more interesting case with Susie and Billy. And here I want to say you need the right model. So here's the first case where the model starts to matter. So again, let me remind you of the story. Susie and Billy are both throwing rocks at the bottle. Susie hits it. Billy doesn't. The bottle shatters. Now your first cut in a model might just have three variables. Susie throws. Billy throws. The bottle shatters. I'm going to skip the exogenous variable. The exogenous variable is whatever causes them to want to throw. Let me ignore that. That's not relevant. OK. In this model, the equations are obvious. The equation would just say, the, if I'm implicitly going to assume they're both perfect shots, I can have a more complicated model that has variables for how accurate they are. But let me ignore that, just for simplicity. And here, the equation for BS is just the disjunction. The bottle shatters if either one of them throws. If I assume they're both accurate shooters, then either one of them throwing, that'll cause the bottle to shatter. I would argue this is not a good model. Why? Well, remember the story. The, said, the story said Susie threw a little bit harder, or Susie threw a few second, milliseconds earlier, and her rock hit the bottle and Billy's didn't. Now, the trouble with this model, in this model, Billy and Susie are absolutely symmetric. It's literally isomorphic to the disjunctive case of the forest fire. All it takes is one match. All it takes is one of them to throw and the bottle shatters. This mo model might make perfect sense if you didn't get to see who threw. You just still saw that they both threw, and you saw at the other end the bottle shattering. And you say, OK, here's my model. This model is not capturing the fact that Susie hit the bottle and Billy didn't. Right? I would say that's a crucial part of the story. Now, I can't prove that's a crucial part of the story, but if we think about how we analyze a story and who we're going to call a cause, that matters. Well, if you think it matters, you better have variables in the model to talk about it. Otherwise. You, you know, bad model gives you bad results. So there are lots of ways of doing this. Let me give you one. I don't mean to say this is the only one, because in fact we have other ones in the paper. But here is one. And again, I'm going to focus on the special case where Susie threw a bit harder, so I'm really just modeling that case. So in that model, we have variables Susie throws and Billy throws. But now I'm going to add two more variables. For Susie hits the rock, uh, hits, Susie hits the bottle, and Billy hits the bottle. Here they are, SH and BH. And the equation is going to say, and again, these equations are only going to capture the situation where Susie threw a bit harder. I have a more general model where, where I allow Billy to throw harder, Susie to throw harder. But if Susie throws harder, well, the equation for Susie hitting is just if Susie throws, Susie hits. What about Billy? Well, Billy's not going to hit unless he throws. But also, he's not going to hit the bottle unless Susie doesn't hit the bottle. I'm going to assume that if Susie hits the bottle, she's the one who hits first. And if she hits the bottle, there's no bottle there for Billy to hit. So the equation for BH says BH is 1, Billy hits, exactly if Billy throws and Susie doesn't hit the bottle. Right? And finally, the bottle shatters if and only if one of them hits, just like before. So I've added two new variables, and I've written equations for them. Now I claim in this model, Susie's a cause and Billy isn't. So now let me go through the definition, remind you the definition had this counterfactual, but it allowed me to fix some variables at their actual value. So in the actual world, come on. Hmm. 
There we go. All right, in the actual world, Billy did not hit. So I'm allowed, according to the definition, this is the W in the definition, I'm allowed to fix some variables at their actual value. So let me fix Billy, let me fix BH, the fact that Billy hit, he didn't hit. So BH is zero, that's what actually happened. Billy didn't hit. Now if I fix BH at zero, now if I switch ST, Susie throws from, zero, from one to zero, she doesn't throw, then I get the counterfactual, the bottle doesn't shatter, which is good. I want to show that Susie's a cause. Here, Susie's a cause, because if you fix some other variable at its actual value, then the counterfactual holds. Then if Susie doesn't throw, the bottle doesn't shatter. I can't play the symmetric game with Billy. This is the key. If I try to play the symmetric game, well, I'm only allowed to fix, I can fix SH, but its actual value is, duh, Susie actually hit the bottle. This is where I'm capturing the fact that in the real world, Susie hit and Billy didn't, right? So if I try to play the symmetric game with, with Susie, it fails. Because I can't fix SH at zero, that's not what actually happened. What actually happened was that SH equals one. If I fix SH to, to one, then it's not true if I switch Billy from throwing to not throwing, the bottle doesn't shatter, right? Because once Susie hits, the bottle shatters, right? Although you might notice that, that if I fix uh, BH to zero here, I'm sort of violating the way the world works. But, so we can debate whether this is capturing the right thing. I think it is, I mean, but again, this is, uh, people feel, feel funny about the fact that by fixing BH to zero, and then, um, and keeping it at zero, even if SH is zero, even if Susie doesn't throw, I mean, the equations tell me if Susie doesn't throw, then BH should be one. So I'm sort of violating the equations by fixing this. So, never, so I'm, I'm contemplating counterfactuals that are inconsistent with the equations, but I seem to need to do that in order to get things to work out right. Believe me, we tried many other definitions. And um, again, I, I, I would like to say, you know, why is this doing the right thing intuitively? It's capturing this duh intuition that why do we call Susie cause and not Billy? It's because Susie hit and Billy didn't so that I'm allowed, you know, I'm sort of thinking, okay, Billy didn't hit, let me keep that fact fixed. And if I keep that fact fixed, then oh yes, if Susie doesn't throw, the bottle doesn't shatter. Whereas if I keep fixed the fact that Susie did hit, well, changing Billy doesn't have any impact. So that's the key and that's where the side condition of keeping other variables fixed at their actual value, that's where it comes into play. Let me show you some consequences of this definition. Uh, another story from the philosophy literature. Uh, this is due to Ned Hall, who's actually currently in the philosophy department at Harvard. So Billy contracts a serious but non-fatal disease. He's treated on Monday, so he's fine on Tuesday. Had Monday's doctor forgotten to treat Billy, Tuesday's doctor would have treated him, and he would have been fine on Wednesday. Now, there's a catch, though. One dose of medication is harmless, but two doses are lethal, so if both doctors treat him, he dies. Okay, you got that? That's the story. Uh, so let's ask some questions. This is the fact that Tuesday's doctor didn't treat Billy. So, so what you have to imagine is Monday's doctor treats him. He marks down on the chart, I treated him. Tuesday's doctor comes along, does the right thing. He looks at the chart, says, oh, Monday's doctor treated him. I better not treat him. He's fine on Wednesday. Okay? All right. So is the fact that Tuesday's doctor didn't treat Billy the cause of him being alive? Well, yes. If Tuesday's doctor had treated him, given that Monday's doctor treated him, he'd be dead. He's about four cause. Are we together? Monday's doctor treated him. We're looking at the setting where Monday's doctor treated him. And in that setting, if Tuesday's doctor treats him, he dies. Tuesday's doctor is about four cause. That's easy. Comes right out of the model. All right? And by the way, the, the, the equations here are obvious, right? I'm not, so the equations say that, that uh, I have three variables. Monday's doctor treats him yes or no. Tuesday's doctor treats him yes or no. Billy's medical condition, he has, it's a variable with four values. Zero says he's okay Tuesday and Wednesday. One says he's sick on Tuesday, okay on Wednesday. That's what happens um, if Monday's doctor, sorry, um, right, if Monday's doctor treats him, um, sorry, this is if Tuesday's doctor treats him too, if he's sick from both Tuesday and Wednesday, that's if neither doctor treats him. So zero is if is Monday's doctor treats him. Two, if only Tuesday's doctor treats him. He has, sorry, he has value one if only Tuesday's doctor treats him. He has value two if neither doctor treats him, and then he's sick both days. And he has value three if both doctors treat him, then he's dead on Wednesday, right? Uh, and, and we can write down the obvious equations. So we can say, what can we say about causality? 
Well, Monday's doctor treating him is a cause of him being okay on Tuesday and Wednesday, right? Because if Monday's doctor hadn't treated him, he'd still be sick on Tuesday. He recovers on Tuesday because Monday's doctor treats him. He's a but-for cause. Um, Monday's doctor treating him is also a cause of Tuesday's doctor not treating him. That's what the equations say. Tuesday's doctor doesn't treat him if Monday's doctor does, right? Tuesday's doctor treating him is a cause of him being alive. We already went through that. But we don't have transitivity. So let me say that slowly. Let's see why. Transitivity says if A is a cause of B and B is a cause of C, then A is a cause of C. Well, notice what's happening here. A is Monday's doctor treating him. Monday's doctor treating him is a cause of Tuesday's doctor not treating him. So this is the B. Monday's doctor treating him is a cause of Tuesday's doctor not treating him. Tuesday's doctor not treating him is a cause of him being alive. That's the C. So A is a cause of B, B is a cause of C. Monday's doctor treating him is not a cause of him being alive. Whatever Monday's doctor does, he's going to be alive. If Monday's, so think about how can we get the counterfactual to hold? If Monday's doctor doesn't treat him, for sure he's going to be alive. The only way he's going to be dead is if both guys treat him. Right? So there's no way you're going to get a counterfactual. There's no way you're going to switch Monday's doctor from treating him to not treating him and make him dead. Right? So think about the way the equations work. So A is a cause of B, B is a cause of C, but A is not a cause of C. There's lots of examples of this form in the literature. This is not the only one. And it's by and large now accepted in the literature that causality is not transitive, although we have this intuition that it ought to be. So for what it's worth, I have a paper that gives necessary conditions, sufficient conditions rather for causality being transitive that I claim come up a lot. And I would argue that that's why we think it typically is the case. But it's actually easy to construct examples in the spirit of this one where pretty much everybody agrees that it, we shouldn't have transitivity. So the puzzle is more that why do we think we should? And, and I, I think I have an answer that says really most of the time we do. But, uh, and, and for people who have some philosophical bent, uh, causality doesn't satisfy right weakening. What I mean by that is A can be a cause of B. B can impri imply B prime, but A is not a cause of B prime. So Monday's doctor is a cause of Billy being okay on Tuesday and Wednesday. That's the zero part. Being okay Tuesday and Wednesday implies that he's alive, but Monday's doctor is not a cause of him being alive. So A can be a cause of B. B logically implies B prime, but A might not be a cause of B prime. All right, let me move right along. So here's where computer science and philosophy meets psychology. So Josh Nob, who's in the philosophy and psychology departments at Yale, did this experiment with, with Fraser. I don't know Fraser. Uh, and it goes like this. The receptionist in the philosophy department who keeps her, pen stocked, her desk stocked with pens. The administrative assistants are supposed to be able to take the pens. That's what they're for. And faculty members are supposed to buy their own. Faculty members are rich. Um, but in practice, both assistants and faculty members take the pens. So you should think of this as saying, statistically, it's just as likely for admins and, and faculty to take pens. On Monday morning, there were two pens. Both the, an assistant and Professor Smith took a pen. So afterwards, there were no pens left. Later, the receptionist needed to take an important message, but there are no pens left in her desk. Who is the cause? Now, as far as but-for causality goes, both the assistant, so the, originally there were two pens. An assistant took one, the professor took the other. It's totally symmetric. If either one hadn't taken a pen, there would have been a pen there. So each of them is a but-for cause of there not being a pen there. So as far as the definition I gave goes, they're both causes. They're both equally good. It's completely symmetric. But if you ask people, they say, Professor Smith is the cause. Why? Well, there's this wonderful paper by Danny Kahneman, the same Danny Kahneman who won a Nobel Prize for Behavioral Economics. He also did work in causality, originally with Tversky, and then there's a later paper with Miller. Um, and he says, an event is more likely to be undone by altering exceptional rather than routine aspects of the causal chain that led to it. So he was actually, even in those days, thinking about counterfactuals. And he was saying, look, when you think about, when people think about counterfactuals, they think of a counterfactual as changing an abnormal thing to a normal thing. So over breakfast today, um, with Zach Lipson, he gave this wonderful example in a chess game. There's a whole sequence of moves, and in the end, you won. So which of the moves caused you to, to win, or which of the moves caused you to lose? You know, presumably the whole chain, you wouldn't have lost. But, but people tend to focus on the one move that was abnormal. 
that was the particularly brilliant move that caused the win or the particularly dumb move, in my case, that caused the loss, right? So people are particularly looking for things that were relatively abnormal. So if you're going to change something in the counterfactual, people tend to prefer changes that change you from an abnormal situation to a more normal situation. There's lots of now psychological experiments to illustrate this. Um, so in this case, which is the one that makes, which is the change that makes the world more normal? So if we assume it's the departmental rule that faculty members, that the pens are supposed to be for the admins, not the faculty members, it's more abnormal for the professor to take the pen than for the admin to take the pen, at least as far as that rule goes. And that we would claim is the reason that people tend to blame the professor. And indeed, when they, when they changed the story, which they did, to saying the departmental rule is that the pens are for the professors and not the admins, then people called the admin the cause, not the professor. Right? So now we've, we've done experiments that, that really support that we're not the only ones, but, but we have some rather nice experiments that sort of suggest that it really is the case that people take normality into account when they're doing this counterfactual reasoning and they prefer changes that make things more normal. But what does normal mean? Well, things that are statistically likely tend to be normal, but conventions trump statistics. So in this case, even if we say that in practice the professors took the pens even more often than the assistants, it's nevertheless still more abnormal for the professor to take the pen than for the assistant, at least according to people. Um, normality can involve moral regulations, conventions. I mean, there's nothing moral about pens being for professors rather than admins. It's just a department rule. Um, statistics, so people consider all of these things when they're judging normality. So in our basic framework, we just augment the framework. I, I'm running out of time, so I won't go into technical details, but we augment the framework by having a normality ordering on worlds and situations. And we, and we say that people call A a better cause of B if when you're looking at the counterfactual that makes A a cause, it makes the world more normal than if you look at the counterfactual that makes B a cause. So what we end up with is sort of a graded notion of causality. We can talk about A being a better cause of something than B. And indeed, we find that people do seem to think that way, but if there's one thing that's a much better cause, they just say that's the cause and not that. But uh, OK, one other thing I want to get to, uh, responsibility and blame. This is joint work with Hannah Choklau. Uh, so Causality is a zero-one notion. Either you're a cause or you're not, right? We can easily extend this to talking about the probability of causality. Uh, if I put a probability, which I will in, in, in the next slide, on the pair MU that I call the setting. So M remembers the causal model, and U is the values of the exogenous variables, the variables at the top of the DAG. Those are the things I'm uncertain about. So I could be uncertain about how the world works. Does smoking really cause cancer? Um, at one point, people weren't sure. Um, or did you really smoke? So did, does smoking cause cancer? That would be captured by the equations. If I thought smoking caused cancer, the equations would have that. That's part of the model M. Did you smoke? That's a setting of the exogenous variable. That's the U. So those are the two sources of uncertainty. And the way I talk about pro the probability that A causes B, if I had a probability on pairs MU, I could say, OK, which context in which pairs MU is A a cause of B and which ones is it not, then I can talk about the probability of the set of pairs in which A is a cause of B. So I can certainly talk about the probability of causality, but I want to say there's a different issue that has nothing to do with probability, and that's what I want to get at with responsibility at least. So suppose B wins an election against G, this was in the days of Bush and Gore, uh, by in a vote of 11 to nothing. So each guy who votes for B is part of a cause of B's winning. But we sure feel differently about 11 to nothing than if it were 6 to 5, right? With 11 to nothing, it's don't blame me. I mean, everybody else voted for him too. Whereas if it's 6 to 5, it was you, right? If you had done something different, it would have been a different outcome. So we gave a naive definition of, of degree of responsibility that captured that intuition. And the definition was simply your degree of responsibility is a number between 0 and 1. It's 0 if you're not a cause, it's 1 over k plus 1 if I have, roughly speaking, if I have to change k things before you become critical. So let me explain in the context of this example. In the case of 6 to 5, every single voter is critical. If that vote had, if one of those six people, any one of the six people had changed their votes, it would have gone the other way. So each of them has degree of responsibility 1 
one is one over zero plus one, because they have to change zero votes to make you critical. In the case of the 11 to nothing vote, the degree of responsibility of each one is one sixth, the six is five plus one, and the five is you have to change five votes before your vote becomes critical. You change five votes, you make it six to five, and then you're critical. So that's a very naive measure of degree of responsibility. It doesn't take into account, you know, if we talk about polluting a river, somebody might have thrown in 20 kilos of pollutant, somebody else 100 kilos. Uh, are they equal? No. We can capture that as well. But nevertheless, this seems to, I'll, I'll skip this example because it's just formalizing what I said before. It captures some intuition, some intuitions about what people do. And let me get back to experiments we did. I think I'll have a few minutes at the end to talk about experiments. So blame is a bit different than responsibility, but related. Uh, when we're determining responsibility, just like causality, I'm assuming that you understand everything about the world. There's no probabilities in sight. Right, so in the voting example, we assume that you understood the vote was 11 to nothing, and then I asked you what's the degree of responsibility, given that the vote was 11 to nothing. But sometimes we want to take uncertainty, that's what I mean by epistemic state, into account. So suppose a doctor treats a patient, he prescribes medication that in fact causes the patient to die, but the doctor had no idea that this was going to cause the patient's death. Well, the doctor had degree of responsibility, one, because had he not prescribed that medication, the patient wouldn't have died. But you might say, well, if he had no idea, maybe he's not to blame, or that's somehow mitigating in the case of blame. Let me give you an, an even, so in legal reasoning, that matters a lot. Uh, what matters is what you believe, but actually what matters also is what you should have known, so that the, in, in the law, we might not take your actual beliefs, we might take what your beliefs should have been, so the jury might say, look, the fact that this medication had bad side effects was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, you should have known. So the epistemic state we're going to take when judging things in the law is the state where you knew, because that's the state a reasonable doctor would have had, right? So roughly speaking, the degree of blame is the expected degree of responsibility. So I assume you have a probability over these pairs MU. Let me give you an example that I hope will make things clear. Consider a firing squad with 10 excellent marksmen Suppose one of them has a live bullet, the rest have blanks, and by the way, they do this in practice when they have firing squads, although usually it's nine people with bullets, not one, but nevertheless, this, this idea that um, nobody knows who has the live bullet in this case. Um, okay, the marksman shoot, they're all perfect shots, he dies. Now, as far as causality goes, only one of those guys is the cause, the one with the live bullet. All the rest aren't causes. They had, you know, didn't matter what they did. Uh, that one who's the cause has degree of responsibility one. If he hadn't shot, the guy wouldn't have died. But if each of the, now from the point of view of each of the marksmen, there are 10 possible causal models. Well, actually there's one model, there are 10 possible contexts, uh, depending on who has the live bullet. If they're all equally likely, the degree of blame is one-tenth, because that's the expected degree of responsibility. So in one of those 10 models, you have degree of responsibility one, in the other nine, you have degree of responsibility zero. Each of the models has probably one-tenth. So your expected degree of responsibility, that's your degree of blame, is one-tenth. And again, I think this is capturing some intuitions that people have. But, you know, the trouble with people. People don't always agree on, on descriptions of causality. They apply multiple intuitions to inferring causality. There's notions of active physical process. Um, we did experiments on Amazon Turk. We, I, I should say, so my, my co-authors here were Toby Gerstenfeld and Josh Tenenbaum. Toby did really most of the heavy lifting here. Uh, it's really amazing. I mean, we had all these ideas. We wanted to check how people ascribed responsibility. And, and you know, we sat down, talked for half an hour or an hour. We sort of came up with some experiments that we thought would be cool. A couple of hours later, Toby calls me back and says, we have results. We can do that now with Amazon Turk. Uh, so it turns out the naive responsibility definition does qualitatively predict how people ascribe responsibility. So we asked them about voting scenarios. So we said things like, okay, to what extent is somebody the cause, to what extent are they responsible if it's five nothing? What about if it's three two? And sure enough, people ascribed, I mean, it wasn't exactly according to the definition, but they ascribed much higher responsibility for three to two than in the case of five nothing. But the other interesting thing is they were also very affected by normality considerations as, the, as the, de you know, the definitions would predict. The way we got at that was by assuming that let's suppose some of these voters are Democrats and some are Republicans. Some are, going, are voting according to the party line and some are going against the party line. Who has the greater degree of responsibility? Well, sure enough, it's the people who are going against the party line 
I guess changing their votes to go the other way would have made the world more normal, according to a reasonable notion of normality. And indeed, people ascribe them higher responsibility. So I mean, we have nice graphs to show this, but it, it's a pretty marked effect. So let me just conclude, and I'll be on time, right, Jeff? Uh, uh, so depending on their focus, it's really interesting. People give different answers to the questions, what's the cause? So this is a lovely story um, due to Denis Hilton. Hilton. Uh, people ask, what is the cause of the traffic accident? The engineer says, hmm, bad road design. The mechanic says, bad brakes. The sociologist says, there was a pub near the highway. The psychologist might say, no, the guy was depressed. Uh, now we would say, look, all these answers are reasonable. What's going on here? Each of these people are writing down a model where different variables are exogenous and endogenous. By and large, why do we care about causality? Well, one of the reasons we care about causality is you know, we want to know what we can change to make it better next time around. Well, each person is focusing on what they think they, you know, they can do something about or that they understand, right? The engineer understands about road design. So for him, the road design becomes an endogenous variable. Things like bad brakes, pub near the highway, and so on, those are exogenous. For the mechanic, OK, I, I deal with brakes. It's the brakes that are, are, are endogenous and everything else is exogenous. For the sociologist, it's the pub that's uh, perhaps that, that, that's endogenous and the rest are exogenous. My point here is there is no right model and by and large, the choice of exogenous and endogenous depends on what you think you have control over and what's beyond your control. So right when I said the exogenous variables are the ones that you want, you want to take as given and that are sort of, you can't do anything about. Well, different people might feel they can do something about different things. So different things will become exogenous and endogenous. I don't want to say any of these models is wrong. You know, it's really up to the modeler. Um, you know, what happens if somebody tomorrow tells me, here's a counterexample to your definition. Well, okay, I won't be happy. I'll typically try to come up with saying, uh, my usual response is, you have the wrong model, let me give you a model where things work out fine. That actually works surprisingly often. But nevertheless, I, I still want to feel, no, my work hasn't been wasted. Um, you know, I didn't, you know, two years of my life down the tubes or something like that. It turns out these definitions, as I've given them to you, are really useful. Useful in what sense? Well, so Anupam Datta and his colleagues have used them to ascribe causality in, in scenarios of accountability, right? So um, Yahoo or Target, pick your favorite company, uh, had made a bunch of mistakes that you know, caused millions of, of, of credit card numbers to be released. What was the cause of that? Um, Dan Susiu and his students looked at causality in databases, and that you, you want to query databases about causality. So you want to know things like, why are you telling me that this is the answer to my query? What is it in the database? And when I ask a query and I say, you know, tell me a director who directed a horror movie in a musical, and you give me an answer, and, and, and um, why did you give me that answer? Right? Which tuples in your database led to that answer? So I basically took this definition. They did a slight tweak that made it more computationally tractable, and they felt they had a very good way of dealing with causality in databases by using this definition. Hannah Chokler used to work at IBM. She's now at King's College. She wrote a piece of software to help software engineers decide why was their program crashing. So these were typically small programs, and you know, which line of code was causing the problem here? You know, she was actually looking at degree of responsibility, so to what extent was this line of code responsible for this program crashing? And she was really using our formal definition of degree of responsibility. And it turned out, we know the programmers really liked it, because when she took down the code for two days to sort of fix up some of the, of the programming, she got lots of complaints from the programmers, we want this tool back. Right? So this turned out to be a useful tool for helping software engineers debug their programs. So, I, look, I really am interested in sort of getting it right. Now, what does getting it right mean? Getting definitions that sort of accord with the way people ascribe causality in a useful way, that the law can use in a useful way, and that means they better, you know, accord to some extent with the way people use it. Um, people, you know, juries are going to have a lot of trouble saying A is a cause of B if you're using the word cause in a way that's totally different from the way they use it in natural language, even if it doesn't have to be exactly the same. Um, 
But you know, the fact that it's useful for software engineers and database designers says that even if somebody finds an example where this isn't working right, it seems to be working right in those contexts. So typically what happens is people find you know, sort of a corner case where it's not doing the right thing. If it's doing the right thing most of the time, pragmatically, it still might be a useful definition. So you know, maybe my two years of work hasn't been wasted. Uh, but my sense is that in terms of going forward, so these days, uh, you know, for those of you who came a couple of hours, an hour and a half ago or so, I, I, these, the framework, the, the causal structures are useful to give definitions of notions like intention and moral responsibility. So even if you don't like the definition of causality, I think causal structures are really useful as a way of sort of organizing how you look at the world for these class of related notions, blame, responsibility, intention, and so on. They can all be given formal definitions in, 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 uh, by using causal structures. And the other thing that, that I think maybe philosophers need to do a lot more, I, th I think it's useful to have a bit of a pragmatic viewpoint. Ultimately, we care about using these definitions to help us do things like assign blame in, in law or, or figure out what is the cause if, if, you know, when there's a data breach or something like that. And even if the definition doesn't get every single example right, it still might be useful. So I'm sort of looking forward to think of large-scale examples where we can understand what's, you know, we have a good sense of what we want the definition to do, and hopefully it'll do the right thing. So let me stop there before Jeff's looking like he's getting antsy, um, and hopefully have some time for questions. So that's it. So uh, thanks for a fascinating talk. I think I finally understood why gun control has been so hard in the U.S. So my question is, uh, uh, can the uh, causality kind of change with time as our as our kind of perception of what is normal changes, let's say, uh, with time. Sure, I mean, <laughs> everything is relative to a causal structure. So our beliefs about what is the right structure, what are the right equations, certainly changes over time. There was a time when people seriously thought that smoking might not be a cause of cancer. I, I, there are actually papers by statisticians that say smoking might not be a cause of cancer. There might be some gene that causes you both want to smoke and to get all the symptoms that we know are associated uh, with cancer. Uh, so people's view of what is the right model clearly changes over time. People's beliefs about what is the right model clearly changes over time. So if you like, all I'm doing here is defining causality relative to a, to a particular model and I'm not giving you any techniques to decide if this is in any sense the right model, right? So that, that lawyers will certainly, even if they accept our definitions, argue about what is the right model to be used. And they'll certainly also argue what is normal, right? So that certainly comes up in the law, again, if you think about things like, well, in, according to the standards of this community, this was a reasonable thing to do. So notions of normality come up all the time in the law, because you can understand the statements of, according to the standards of this community, it's OK to, to you know, walk around in the nude or something like that, right? So um, definitely these things change over time. So think of this as a, you know, this causal model is describing the way you think the world works right now. Maybe tomorrow I'll think differently. Sorry. Uh, I, I, speaking of time, right. on the rock throwing example, I'm wondering why it wasn't modeled that Susie threw the rock at time that uh, So shattered. we have a model in the paper that does exactly that. So we have timestamp oh. variables. Okay. All right, we get the same answer. So we have variable, there's nothing. But it seems like then you wouldn't have had to do, hold that variable. Uh, you still have to hold it. The, the, the essential, because we should take it offline, yeah, but, but okay. we definitely, so there's, if you want to incorporate time, there's absolutely nothing stopping you from saying uh, at Susie throws a time t, Billy throws a time t1. You'll have timestamp variables. You could also have a variable saying Billy throws a t that's false, Billy throws a t1 that's true. So we actually did this. We, we had a model with timestamp variables. But, um, but was the question, did the bottle shatter at time t due to Susie? Oh, I see. So certainly if you say, if you get into a really fine-grained model, there's no question you could say, well, Susie's the cause of the bottle shattering at 3 o'clock, not Billy, because had Susie not thrown, the bottle would have shattered at time 3 plus epsilon. That's certainly true, and then Susie's even a but-for cause. Yeah. But I don't think that captures what people want here. So but if you model time at that level of granularity, which you can, that's a perfect, in some cases that's, that's an absolutely reasonable model, um, things like the gust of wind becomes a cause, because <laughs> had the wind not blown with just that speed, the the rock might have come, you know, a fraction of a, you know, a nanosecond earlier. 
that becomes a cause, and people don't want to think of that as a cause. So sure, you're entitled to take a model where you're modeling things at that level of granularity. At that level of granularity, some things become simpler, because then Susie clearly is about for cause. You don't have to do any of the fancy stuff. I don't, you know, again, in that law case, so it's true that, that, that um, because of the heroin, he died on Monday, and, and he didn't die on Tuesday. Had there been no heroin, he would have died Tuesday. But people talk about cause of death, not cause of death on Monday. And I don't <laughs> think the law would, you know, I mean, the law did not, you know, the, the, just, the, the Supreme Court did not feel that they were going to solve the problem by talking about why did he die on Monday as opposed to why did he die. So, so, okay. that, uh, so I'm not disagreeing. Of course, if you model at that level of granularity, things become simpler. But I do point out there are other problems, because you get things that, that are causes that you probably do not want to be causes, like the gust of wind. Um, let's go back and forth, so how about over here? Uh, it's beautiful work. I'm trying to understand the motivation for, this, for seeking a unitary definition of cause, because it seems to me there are multiple things you could be trying to do. You could think that this is part of metaphysics and there should be one right answer. You could think that this is part of psychology, in which case there might be multiple answers. You could think it's part of some utilitarian search for uh, debugging programs and fixing roads, in which case you wouldn't expect a unitary solution either. So I'm just wondering what Well, so I think all the of search. the above. Um, so I would prefer, I mean, look, if I couldn't do it with one definition, I would back off and say, well, let's look at two or three. It's certainly the case that people use a whole complex of words. I think there's a whole complex of notions that people use words like blame, responsibility, causality, culpability for. And there's four or five different notions. I personally don't think there's a bunch of different notions of causality, but there are people who I, I, I know ascribe to at least two different notions of causality. I can take off, let's take offline what, the, what they're like. I think we can get away with one notion of causality. I'm happy, I, I prefer to ascribe the fact that people, some people say A is a cause of B, other people don't. I would typically ascribe that to people using different models rather than using different definitions of causality. So my hope is we can get away with one definition of causality. Uh, you know, if you give me enough examples where we really need more than one, maybe I'll back off and say, okay, let's have more than one. But at least so far, I, I feel like I've been able to get everything I want with just one. Although, again, there are other notions that are closely related that are different, like responsibility and blame. But maybe that's a discussion we should have offline. Uh, oh, one more. All right. I'll okay. So, be fair. Uh, yeah, I think there's another distinction here about how useful it is. Because Sure, when you talk about databases or, or program checking, or, or these are statistical things. We are happy if we are right 90% of the time. Mm -hmm. But if I am a lawyer and I have to defend some accused person, I can tell you this accused person is the new counterexample to your current model. Because it's always open to coming up with the next counterexample. Uh, look, Shai, I agree that, that, you know, I wish I could tell you that, that I have absolute proof that this is the right definition. Um, I, law is going to use causality whether we like it or not, so that, that at least if they're going to use it, I would argue first that they should have a formal definition, which they don't beyond the but-for definition. Uh, so at least once they have a formal definition, the lawyers can agree on what they're disagreeing about. Um, if you have the counterexample, let's talk. But, but in the meantime, uh, I guess I would... I, I believe, and obviously I'm biased, that this is the best thing going. And if you're going to have to use, if you're going to talk about causality at all, you might as well go with something that seems to be pretty good until you find a counterexample. But I, I you know, I agree. If, if, if I was the lawyer defending my client and I thought that you had the wrong definition, I would not be happy. Uh, you know, what can I say? Yeah.